In life, there are very few things that can leave people of all ages truly captivated, inspired, and left with a sense of childlike bewilderment. Through adulthood, we often lose sight of the things that once grabbed our attention relentlessly and never failed to amaze us. We see through the smoke and mirrors behind some of the greatest attractions of all time. The world's magic and spectacle now disappear into fantasy rather than the world around us. The beauty found within wonder is lost in our mind's newfound abilities to analyze and comprehend the world around us. Skyscrapers are just buildings, elephants, giraffes, just animals. Superheroes are just actors in costume trying to get rent money through tips. And the monsters under our beds have all vanished into the shadows from which they came. Yet, in adulthood, there has been one thing that has not released itself from my subconscious. Something that no matter how much research I perform, there is always something new for me to discover. The wonderful world of prehistory. Paleontology is described as the study of our planet during time before humanity. Yet, I believe that through paleontology, there can be a deeper understanding of the modern world and how we humans see the world. We now stand amidst the light of discovery, and in the past 60 years, more information about this planet and our existence on it has been brought to light than in the entirety of the past 300,000 years of human existence. Now, through the lens of Jon Favreau and Apple TV's 2022 documentary, Prehistoric Planet, using the latest imaging technology, we are able to see the wonders of our planet as it was 66 million years ago. Now, in order to get an appreciation of prehistoric planet, we need to take a look at how the public views dinosaurs as a whole in the modern day. The most predominant view of dinosaurs comes from the Jurassic Park, now Jurassic World series of films. Jurassic Park by Michael Crichton was written in 1990 and acted as a critique of the newly found genetic power that humanity had come to possess. With humans creating bacteria used for insulin that would finally allow the cost of insulin to drastically decrease, as there was no longer a need for pig insulin, this led to an ethical debate at the Supreme Court level when the gene used to create insulin was attempted to be patented. The ethical question of, do humans have the ability to own living creatures? The book answered this question with the escape of the dinosaurs and the subsequent killing of several characters, eventually resulting in the destruction of the island, which proved unsuccessful as many species of dinosaur had escaped into the mountains of Costa Rica. Michael Chryson's thesis of the book was that man could not play God. Man cannot create life and hold dominion over it. Otherwise, consequences never before seen will come about. When Jurassic Park was picked up by Steven Spielberg and Universal Studios in 1993, this question remained mostly answered with Ian Malcolm, who simplified much of Crichton's thesis into, simply put, I'm, I'm simply saying that life uh, finds a way. Can you see the danger, uh, John, inherent uh, in what you're doing here? Genetic power is the most awesome force the planet's ever seen, but you wield it like a, a kid that's found his dad's gun. Yet, this critique of humanity has gone largely overlooked by the general public, who simply saw dinosaurs come back to life in an all-new and lively manner, and were awestruck by the sights and sounds of these animals. Yet, less than a decade later, much of Jurassic Park would become outdated. With evidence of feathers on dinosaurs becoming increasingly prominent, the realization that dinosaurs could not pronate their wrists, and, and the realization that dinosaurs would have much more fat and muscle than was depicted in Jurassic Park and its sequel, The Lost World, Jurassic Park. This was explained away in 2001's Jurassic Park 3, with Sam Neill's Alan Grant stating, Dinosaurs lived 65 million years ago. What is left of them is fossilized in the rocks, and it is in the rock that real scientists make real discoveries. Now, what John Hammond an InGen did at Jurassic Park is create genetically engineered theme park monsters, nothing more and nothing less. And then again in 2015's Jurassic World through B.D. Wong's Henry Wu, stating, Nothing in Jurassic World is natural. We have always filled gaps in the genome with the DNA of other animals. And if their genetic code was pure, many of them would look quite different. But you didn't ask for reality. You asked for more tea. These two moments in the films have led to the formerly progressive 1993 film becoming something that has led public perception of dinosaurs to remain frozen in time for nearly three decades. 
While the most recent film, Jurassic World Dominion, has attempted to rectify the damage caused by Jurassic World specifically choosing to use outdated depictions of dinosaurs, with feathers being on almost every appropriate species, and the inclusion of the newly discovered Moros Intrepidus, the film features a heavy ignorance of science that no longer reflects the modern view of our planet and our current science. Prehistoric Planet and scientific advisor on both this docu-series and Jurassic World Dominion, Stephen Brusati, have made a massive effort to rectify the failings caused by the franchise, with depictions of many animals in the Jurassic World franchise being given paleo-accurate looks in this series. These two schools of thought, the Hollywood monstrosities and the quiet naturalistic animals that can be found in popular media, can be used to show the worldviews that are found in our modern society. Throughout the two centuries of the science, paleontology has oftentimes been a way to understand the culture around science at the time, and the creation of paleomedia at that time. Prehistoric Planet, for example, accurately shows what I like to refer to as the Space Age worldview. As after we began to explore the stars, it is there that we realized how small not only we, but our planet, solar system, and galaxy truly are. It is upon seeing how insignificant we are that we have allowed ourselves to understand and see the world without the biases of theology and a misconception of human significance standing in the way of discovery, thus allowing us to understand life in objective manners. In order to understand how far we have come in looking at prehistory without sensationalism, I believe it's important to analyze some previously released documentaries and how they reflect the world around them at the time of their inception. Possibly the most influential documentary in paleontology is the 1993 BBC series, Walking with Dinosaurs. Walking with Dinosaurs was the first ever major documentary to exist in the post-Jurassic Park era, in that it implemented groundbreaking CGI technology as well as animatronics in a similar method to the 1993 film, as well as being the first paleo-nature documentary of all time. When Walking with Dinosaurs was first conceived, the series was asked by the showrunner to create Jurassic Park quality visual effects with the budget of less than one-fifth of that film's budget of $63 million. The $9.9 .9 million budget would be put towards creating over three hours of dinosaur footage, as opposed to Jurassic Park's measly nine minutes of footage. This series showed the ambition that came about in the dawn of a new millennia. Many innovations came about during the 90s, as projects became more and more ambitious with creations of things like Google, the text message, Photoshop, and three-dimensional graphics. Walking with Dinosaurs was an incredible reflection of the 90s. Extremely ambitious, groundbreaking, and constantly on the cutting edge of what is possible. On a philosophical level, the series allowed humanity to connect with a past that it never knew. By showing no sign of the modern world until after the extinction of the dinosaurs, it immerses the audience deep into the world of the Mesozoic era, while also showing how creatures of humble beginnings can ascend to the level of global domination despite seemingly unbearable odds against them. This sentiment is similar to the story of humanity that we understood at the time, where we once began as small mammals crushed under the heels of dinosaurs, Eventually, we evolved to become a dominant force over the planet after heavy trials and tribulations. Another documentary that is just as noteworthy to mention is the infamous Jurassic Fight Club, a series that is just as ridiculous as the name implies. The series was released by the History Channel in 2008 and sought to show of various battles that occurred throughout the time of the dinosaurs. Yet, while the show's premise seems alluring and interesting, it is within its execution and emphasis on pseudoscience where this concept falls apart. From the mispronunciation of Majungasaurus, Deinonychus using thunder to mask its footsteps, the inclusion of Nanotyrannus as its own genus, which is still very heavily contended by like four people, but I digress, and an over-reliance on violence that is physically nonsensical. Jurassic Fight Club chooses to embellish the idea of viewing dinosaurs as monsters, with the urge to do nothing but kill. The name should be a telltale sign of this aspect of the show. 
with the inclusion of Jurassic being a clear attempt to make viewers connect to this series to the Jurassic Park series. A tactic commonly used in bootlegs of those films and other franchises attempting to leech off the brand. Jurassic Fight Club shows paleo media during a time after 9-11. The world became a place where being edgy for the sake of being edgy was the norm. In 2008, the housing crisis in the United States came about. The United States was at war in the Middle East, and the first ever social networks were in the processes of finding their footing. The documentary depicts prehistoric life as this backwards, ultra-violent, and edgy thing, and that is a clear reflection of those times. The documentary fails to deliver a message other than, look how cool these big monsters fighting are. And as to such, the only thing that can be taken away from the series on a deeper level is that nature and the world as a whole is a place full of nothing of substance, except for violence and a survival of the fittest mentality. Now, on to Prehistoric Planet. The series is split into five parts, each detailing life on Earth in different environments, coasts, deserts, freshwater, ice worlds, and forests, to be precise. The series has the most accurate depiction of dinosaurs that has ever been put to film, not only in design, but also in behavior. No animal is given the time to become anthropomorphized, like in Walking with Dinosaurs. And very rarely are there ever any depictions of animals fighting to the death, like in Jurassic Fight Club. Prehistoric Planet's decision to omit these two aspects of previous paleo media can be attributed to the worldview that remains present in the early 2020s. A worldview that is much more progressive and aware of nature. A new perception of gender and sex in the animal kingdom is put on display, showing that there is not as defined of a line as what was previously thought. Displaying the first ever depiction of satellite male behavior in a dinosaur documentary with the Barbarodactylus. More speculative ideas founded in modern dinosaur anatomy and behavior are also seen throughout the series. The air sex found on the necks of Dreadnoughtus inflating, a troodont of using fire as a tool to hunt its prey. The previously mentioned satellite male behavior and facial discs on the Mononychus, similar to that of a barn owl. These concepts are all a reflection of the modern understanding of the world. The Earth has existed for billions of years, and life has existed on this planet for over three billion of those years. The world was very different during the Maastrichtian age of the Cretaceous, yes, but animals have always been animals. Nature remains nature. There is a wonder that is found in seeing such familiar things in the alien because it grounds them in our world. It's like seeing the world through a funhouse mirror. The base is all there, yet things are enhanced and molded into something so fantastic, yet nevertheless real. Nature is a beautiful thing. Every day when we look outside our window, we see it. Nature is not a constant struggle to survive where everything tries to kill everything else. Nature is something that is so beautiful to us as people. It provides a real escape from the day-to-day -day lives that society traps us in. There are no worries of rent, bills, taxes, or education and career paths in nature. And Prehistoric Planet captures that more than any other dinosaur documentary in history, as it truly lives up to the dream of bringing dinosaurs, just as they were 66 million years ago, on display for us to see. Earlier in this essay, I brought up the point of the Jurassic World franchise of films and how it failed modern audiences by not presenting accuracy with its animals. And some may be wondering why I believe accuracy is so important in a fictional series that supposedly has no purpose but to entertain, and I fundamentally disagree with that sentiment. The series does have a responsibility to inform because unlike Star Wars, Marvel and DC Comics, Harry Potter and other massive franchises, where there is a clear distinction of fictional events to the audience, the Jurassic World franchise deals with real-world animals that did exist. In our modern world, there is still contention on that fact. As a matter of fact, in June of 2021, a study commissioned by Boat Rocker Studios found that 40% of Americans think that dinosaurs died out anywhere between two and 10,000 years ago. While that may not be the fault of the franchise, the thousands of science has ruined dinosaur articles that are posted and clicked on every day is a direct fault of the series. 
In the modern world, more and more people are turned off to the idea of reality because they have become so accustomed to the spectacle that people are willing to criticize the works of paleontologists for the simple reason that they aren't keeping the conservative views of dinosaurs as monsters. Prehistoric Planet is a key first step to begin bringing the disillusionment of the world to an end. To restore a sense of wonder and curiosity rather than encouraging fantasy in the pursuit of capital, Jurassic Park and its sequels were always about holding power accountable. And now that we live in the modern age, where that very franchise has become so irresponsible with its power, thinking that there would be no consequences committing what I call the rape of the natural world. To quote Jurassic Park once again, Prehistoric Planet is a beautiful marvel that shows the wonders of our planet. And it's incredibly important to instill people all over the world to reconnect with nature as it becomes a more important matter by the day as a result of previous human ignorance. The series allows us to properly stand in the light of discovery, as John Hammond says in Jurassic Park, and embrace nature as it was then, is now, and hopefully always will be. Now, be sure to leave a like and subscribe and do all the fun engagement things so this video can get a billion fucking views. That would be awesome. But, <laughs> um, so I, I talked a lot about how paleo media reflects the time. And I wanted to sort of bring an addendum to this with Jurassic World as a franchise. The mid 2010s were a time of great change in a lot of things. It was a very forward thinking movement, but it was also a very nostalgic time, specifically with our. Our, me our media. Things like the Star Wars sequels were just becoming to come about. A lot of legacy things began, a lot of legacy sequels began to come out of the woodwork. You know, you have things like The Force Awakens, Creed, Jurassic World. A lot of that nostalgia started to come forward. And I think that Jurassic World is a great reflection of that. Jurassic World thematically is about keeping things pure, keeping things as they should be. And it also, it's a reflection of Jurassic Park and the nostalgia of 2015 because it takes Jurassic Park and just pushes it into the modern world. It just recontextualizes Jurassic Park, as a lot of people say. So the point I'm trying to make is that Jurassic World is a sort of reflection of the nostalgic feeling that people were having in the mid 2010s where everyone wanted to simultaneously go forward with radical new ideas while also staying in the past no one wants to get old but in the mid 2010s it seemed like everyone was getting old so they wanted to bring things back to make them sort of feel younger again that's why you have those legacy sequels you want to get that experience of being a kid going to the theater to see jurassic park on opening night because who doesn't want that who doesn't want to relive those memories? Me, because I wasn't there. But if I could relive seeing Jurassic World for the first time, oh my god. I remember seeing that movie in theaters and it, it, was a, it blew me away. It blew little 12-year-old me away. <sighs> but uh, yeah, this was just an addendum to sort of wrap things up. Not in a neat little bow, but just because I wanted to also add that point that Jurassic World also sort of reflects in a similar... Jurassic Park and Jurassic World in themselves are sort of documentary because they show the fears of the time in a fictional setting rather than in a non-fictional setting. And they can do this in a more direct way because it shows direct interaction between man and nature. So I think that Jurassic World does reflect um, a lot of the views that we had in the mid-2010s. Uh, anyways, it's 2 a.m. This is the second time that I'm recording this, and I'm really hoping that my recording software actually picked up my audio this time, instead of making me do this for a third time, because I would like to sleep. It's finals week, and tomorrow I have to go Christmas shopping. So, um, thank you so much for joining me, and as always, I will see you next time. Thank you for a fabulous 2022.